When I met Alan Paul, they were working on tracks that became Land of Rape and Honey. Uh, tracks that also became uh, Thousand Homo DJs, Palehead, which I was involved with. That was the first thing I did. I met them in London, at Southern Studios in London, uh, where they were recording and where they had been recording for a long time. And the day I met Al was the day I met Bill and Paul. They kind of came in and out of the studio uh, while me and Al were working. And I mean, within half an hour of meeting Al, he asked me to work with him. Yeah, the reason I was there was I was looking for um, a, a record deal with Wax Tracks for my band, The Finney Tribe. And um, so Southern Studios in London also was uh, an umbrella for a bunch of different labels, Discord, uh, Crass Records, all these punk labels, and Wax Tracks. And when I moved to the States in 88, Rape and Honey was still being worked on. I met Al in, I think it was 87, uh, early in 87, and they were working on it then. And uh, I kept in touch, and um, I visited and um, recorded some stuff that would become Revolting Cox material, went back to Scotland, then moved and when I moved, I remember they were working on uh, The Missing and Deity. Those were the two tracks. And during that time is when the album was finished. I thought it was the most radical music I'd heard for years. I really did. It was so radical. Maybe I didn't appreciate this as much at the time, but I do appreciate it now. As a producer, which Alan Paul were, Luxapan Productions, they were producing the record. You have to use machines and use humans to get the sound you want. And if that human is not producing the sound you want, you just don't use that. Um, but I remember when I did, uh, for example, uh, The Missing, I was about four in the morning and uh, it was at Chicago Track Studio and I'd been there for days, it seemed like. Um, and I remember uh, doing it, and I remember being surprised that it actually made the cut later on. The record became so edited down, which was really great because it had that kind of punk energy to it. Nothing, the fat was all trimmed off. Everything was like bam, 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 and I think that was the intention. It's definitely my favorite because I think it's the most focused. I think Rape and Honey has this focus and this absolute pinpointed anger about it that became a lot less focused and a lot more spread out on the subsequent album. And I think that maybe bled over into other records as well. The ministry didn't repeat themselves. Uh, and they definitely didn't with the follow-up to Rape and Honey. Uh, and Rape and Honey followed Twitch, and it was radically different from Twitch. Uh, but I think it stands on its own. I think Deity is my favorite track. I think that's just a great, great song. And I'm really lucky that I got to actually play these songs live. Playing Deity live, which I got to do, was just a blast. It was just an insane ride. <laughs> And it was only for two minutes, but it was like, <laughs> the song could crash at any second. The crowd went bananas, you know, it was just this whirlpool. We used to call it the washing machine out there, of just kids just going bananas. Did you have any involvement with the artwork? No, I had nothing to do with the sleeve at all. It was, uh, I, I don't know who did it, I, I, actually, I can't even remember. Uh, a great sleeve because, you know, when you realize what it is, it's shocking really shocking but it's not in your face shocking it's subtle and you're like oh i think definitely sonically um the sounds on this record are unique enough but cohesive enough that it still stands the test of time i think it could be remastered and maybe sound louder and better but you know that's 
that's kind of splitting hairs. It's still a powerful record to me. And I think the message is still there. Uh, the message in all these sort of political ministry records is still absolutely valid, uh, even more so now.